Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. How is everyone tonight? Good. I just wanted to make a quick announcement before uh, I get into the intro here. Uh, next year's schedule is now available. One program note for that is there will not be a lecture here at JPL in January. Uh, we have Dr. Steve Squires, who's the project uh, principal investigator for the two rovers, doing a five-year anniversary talk for the rovers over at Beckman Auditorium at Caltech on the Thursday night. The Friday night will be Dr. John Callis, who's the project manager for the rovers, uh, doing that a very similar talk um, on Friday at PCC as usual. Okay? All right. Thank you very much. All right. In 1998, two groups presented startling evidence that the expansion of the universe is accelerating, and the term dark energy was coined as a label for the cause of this acceleration. So now we have a name, but what is the nature of this mysterious component that we now believe makes up more than 70% of the energy density of the universe? And what types of evidence for dark energy are there? And how solid is it? And furthermore, what techniques might reveal some answers? And where do we begin? These are a few of the questions that have captured the attention of cosmologists as well as the general public. And our guest will attempt to explain some of these questions and perhaps reveal a few of the answers. Tonight's guest is an astrophysicist in JPL's astrophysics and space science section. He came to JPL in 1998 after receiving a BS with honors in physics from Stanford University and a PhD in physics from the University of California, Santa Barbara in 1994. He has published a multitude of articles and won a variety of awards, one notably being JPL's Lou Allen Award for Excellence as a promising young researcher. His current research and interests are centered on developing approaches and techniques to measure the content and geometry of the universe. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming tonight's guest, Dr. Michael Seifert. Hello, everyone. Uh, uh, thank you very much for uh, coming tonight. I'd like to take some time tonight to tell you about some of the very exciting things that are happening in cosmology, and particularly some of the developments over the past 10 years or so. One of the biggest questions we can ask is, what is the universe made of? It seems to be made of lens control over here. <laughs> Give these guys a few seconds here. Great, okay. What is the universe made of? The Greek philosopher Plato wrote one of the earliest books on cosmology, the Timaeus. And he, uh, he posited that the universe was made out of five elements, which he identified with these geometric shapes. Our modern view, of course, is quite different, but we're still asking the same basic question. What is the universe made of? Well, the modern astronomical approach to trying to answer this question is to take some of our most powerful instruments, point them at the uh, depths of space, and count up what we see. This is an image from the Hubble Space Telescope of a rich cluster of galaxies. Each of these little blobs that you can see here, that's a galaxy, that's a galaxy, that's a galaxy. Each of these galaxies has millions or maybe hundreds of millions of stars in it. And so the first thing that we know our universe is made of is stars. Uh, there is also a part of this that you can't see so easily, um, and that's gas. There's a lot of gas in this cluster of galaxies. And it's hard to see, just as the oxygen that we breathe in this room can be difficult to see, so is it difficult to see the gas in this cluster. But we know it's there, and we know it's there because it's hot. And it's not just red hot or white hot, it's glowing X-ray hot. And we can take the NASA's Chandra X-ray telescope and point it at this region, and what we see is a startling blob of X-ray emission. That X-ray emission is coming from this blob of hot gas that's sitting in the middle of that cluster of galaxies. Okay, so now we know the universe has stars and has gas. What else might the universe have in it? Well, there's another component that we can see, or, or rather can't see, or not directly anyway, but we can deduce that it's there. That component is called dark matter, and that's mass that's unlike the ordinary mass in this room, in our soul, uh, on our planet, uh, the chairs that we're made of. We think it's a fundamental particle uh, of a kind that we've yet to detect in a laboratory. So that sounds like a load of baloney. How do you, why should you believe me, right? <laughs> well, it has an effect. Turns out that you can, 
you can count up the, the stars and the gas, and you can ask how much mass, how much gravitational mass is there in the stars and the gas and all of that stuff that's in this cluster. And well, you just start adding it up, and you can come up with a number. It also turns out that these galaxies are whizzing around. That gas is very hot. It wants to fly apart. And so uh, you can ask whether that mass that you counted up is sufficient to gravitationally hold all of those components together. And the answer is no. It's not enough. It's not enough by a long shot. Um, and so that's led uh, astronomers and physicists to believe that there's an additional unseen component, which we call dark matter, that exists in this cluster of galaxies holding that stuff together. Well, you might still be a little skeptical, but there's actually a, no, a, a wide variety of other measurements that all, all tell us the same basic picture. I'll come back to a few of those in a bit. Uh, but I think we're on relatively solid footing with those components, with stars, gas, and dark matter. Now, that basic picture has led to what I call the pie chart of the universe. Um, so I said there were stars. That turns out when you count maybe about 0.4% of the energy content of our universe. Gas, mostly hydrogen and helium, that's about 4%. Uh, dark matter, about 23%. There's a little particle called a neutrino. I'm not going to talk much about that during this talk. That's a small component, 0.3%. Uh, and the startling thing that uh, astronomers and physicists have come to appreciate over the last 10 years or so, relatively recently, is that we believe that about 73% of the energy content of the universe is made up of something that we call dark energy. Uh, and I'll try to spend most of this talk telling you why we think that and what the issues with that are. Um, you may ask, what about this? What about our planet, this stage, the chairs, and everything? Those don't even rate. They're a tiny, tiny sliver on this chart. Tiny, tiny sliver. Oh, and some of you who are, who are maybe sticklers for detail may notice that these numbers don't quite add up to 100%. Well, don't worry too much about that. You know, they, these numbers aren't particularly uh, accurate at the last decimal place anyway. So throughout this talk, I'll try to tell you about three things. First of all, what is dark energy? What is the evidence for it? And should I believe it? Is it solid? Um, how can we learn more? What, what sorts of instruments do we need to build? What sorts of observa observations do we need to make? What sort of approaches would lead us to understand this question better and start understanding some of the answers? So I'll start off with what is it and, and how solid is the evidence? So let me begin with a little bit of history lesson. We've known for some time that the universe is expanding. Our, our first appreciation of this came from Edwin Hubble, a famous astronomer. In 1929, he published a paper in which he described some observations of nearby galaxies. What he noticed was that when you look at nearby galaxies, they all seem to be moving away from us. Furthermore, the galaxies that are a little bit farther away seem to be moving a little bit faster away from us. And galaxies that are even further away are moving even further uh, away from us, or moving faster away from us. So we put together this plot where we have distance on one axis and velocity on another. So stuff that's close is moving slowly, and stuff that's far away is moving faster. Well, at first that may seem a little puzzling, so I'd like you to indulge in the following thought experiment. Let's have each of you imagine that I asked you to put five feet between you and the, and the nearest neighbor sitting next to you. And in the next 30 seconds, I asked you to put another five feet between you and your nearest neighbor. So now there's 10 feet between you. In the next 30 seconds, imagine putting another five feet between you and your nearest neighbor. Well, what would you all see? If you looked at the person sitting right next to you, you would, you'd be getting further away from them at a rate of about five feet every 30 seconds. If you looked across the room, you'd see the people at the end of the room, they'd be flying away from you as everybody tries to jostle around to create that extra space, the people furthest away from you will be moving away from you much faster. And that's sort of analogy for the content of this plot. Um, just as a historical note, this, this was really fascinating stuff. I mean, that you can't imagine how, uh, 
how um, incredibly exciting it was to hear that there were other galaxies and that the universe was expanding. That was a big deal in 1929. And it was done with the 100-inch uh, telescope that exists right up here on Mount Wilson. They have tours on the weekend. You can take a look at the telescope that did this work. Very cool thing. So I kind of glossed over the detail of, well, you know, how do I know how far away that galaxy was and how do I know how fast it was moving away from us? How do we know we haven't gotten all that wrong? Why should I really believe that the universe is expanding? Well, let me describe a few of the techniques that Hubble used to come to his conclusions because they're relevant for how we think about things today. For the distance, he used something called a Cepheid variable star. Uh, Cepheid comes from the constellation Cepheus, which is uh, in the northern sky right next to the constellation uh, Cassiopeia. And this is a kind of, uh, a Cepheid is a kind of variable star that, that varies in brightness, and it varies in a way in which allows you to tell something about the star. It turns out that the time that it takes for that star to vary in brightness tells you how absolutely bright it is. Okay? Um, in cosmology, we call that a standard candle. And let me try to, try to explain this a bit further. So I've taken a picture of two candles here in my living room. It's the same candle, right? It's a just ordinary white candle. The one that's farther away looks dimmer than the one that's closer. Duh, right? <laughs> no big deal. And it turns out that if you know exactly how bright these things are, you can calculate how, how far away they are. You can calculate that this one is further away than this one. Um, and we can do the same thing with this, with this Cepheid variable star. Um, through its time scale of variation, you can tell how intrinsically bright that, that star is. And then you can, you can uh, take a look at the star and see how bright it appears to be and use the difference between those to calculate how far away it is. And that's what Hubble did to, uh, to determine distances of these galaxies. Um, Hubble uses this uh, distance that all, or this unit of distance that all astronomers use, a megaparsec, which is some number of millions of light years. A light year is the distance that light can travel in one year. So it's a long ways, right? Long ways. Well, what about the velocity part of this? We know this is how Hubble found the distance. How did he find out how fast the galaxies were moving away from us? Um, he relied on taking the spectra of galaxies. Now, it turns out that you can determine the velocity of a galaxy from measuring its spectra. A spectrum is a result of passing light from a source, like a galaxy, uh, through a dispersing mism, uh, through a dispersing medium. So a simple example is a simple prism. This is the album cover from Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon. Some of, the, some of you who are my age remember this album. Uh, white light comes in one end of the prism, and it's broken into its rainbow of colors. The modern astronomical equivalent of this is more sophisticated, but it's the same basic concept. You take light, you run it through a dispersing mechanism, and you record how much red, how much blue, how much yellow there is, and you make a graph of it. And in this case, there's not very much blue. That's because it's a bit lower on this plot. And there's more red. Okay? And there's all these little extra doodads and features and stuff. And from measuring this uh, spectrum, you can tell how fast the galaxy appears to be moving away from us. The expansion of the universe causes a light from a, from a galaxy to be shifted to longer wavelengths. And you can use this effect to measure the apparent velocity of an object, or such as a galaxy. And I'll try to demonstrate that here. So here's, here's another plot of a spectra like I had on the previous page. Okay? And a galaxy that's further away, that's moving away from us faster, would have its light shifted to the right like that. And I'll do it a couple more times. Okay, so I'll run it back. So as it's, as it's moving away from us faster, its light is shifted to the right. That's called redshift. And one can, use, one can measure uh, the specter of galaxies and compute this effect, and that gives you an idea of how fast the galaxy is moving away from us. So those are the two parts of it, the distance and the velocity. So uh, Hubble did that initial work in 1929. And it turns out that 
he was off in his calibration a bit, so his, his results are actually wrong by a factor of several. Uh, but he was onto the right track. We now have much better data from the Hubble Space Telescope. And we should note it's called the Hubble Space Telescope because one of the reasons it was built was to do the same job, and do it better, and have higher quality data. So this is a similar plot. Again, we have distance on this axis, velocity on this axis. And uh, it may not be readily apparent, but uh, for comparison, here's Hubble's original measurement. Okay. So now we have data from galaxies that are much farther away. And we see the same trend continue. The stuff that's further away is moving, appears to be moving away from us faster. And we can keep trying to look further and further away to, uh, to keep, keep doing this effect. At some point, those Cepheid variable stars become dim that even with the Hubble Space Telescope, you can't see them. So we have to turn to other techniques to measure the distances of those galaxies. Um, so that was done in this paper where they've measured stuff way out here now. Hubble's original data is just this tiny blue box down here. As I said, the Cepheid variables start petering out over here. And we have to use a different kind of standard candle. In this case, it's a, the standard candle is called a supernova 1A. Okay? A supernova, as you guys have probably heard, is a star that has exploded. Okay? It's very bright for a short amount of time. A supernova 1A is a particular kind of supernova. It's a supernova where there was a, a, a very dense uh, star, and it has gobbled up gas from a nearby companion star. And it, keep, and it just gravitationally attracts some of that gas. The gas flows onto that star, and it keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And when it reaches a critical mass, a, ther a runaway thermonuclear explosion takes place, and the whole thing goes Kaboom. Here's a picture of one. This is uh, supernova 1994. That's the supernova here. This is the, the rest of the galaxy. Ordinarily, it would be hard to even see the star that this supernova came from. But for a short amount of time, this supernova is as bright as the rest of the galaxy put together. So for a short amount of time, they're very bright. Well, how, do you, how does one make a, a standard candle out of this? Well, let me show you a sequence of photos. So the, these are time slices here. So each photo represents a different, uh, a different uh, observation with the telescope, different slice in time. And, uh, and this is, uh, this, this is a, a funny astronomer photo in which we've made things that are bright black and things that are dark white. So it's kind of like a negative. So this black blob all the way through here, that's the center of the galaxy. Okay. And if you follow along here in various time sets, first of all, you don't see anything here. And then all of a sudden, you see this tiny little speck. And then all of a sudden, kablooey, you see the supernova. So it goes from nothing to very quickly becoming very bright. And then it fades over time. And it turns out that by measuring the time that it takes for it to get bright and the time that it takes for it to fade, uh, we can calculate how bright that supernova had to have been. If we know, know how bright it had to be intrinsically, we can use how bright it appeared to be. And uh, between the two, we can calculate the distance. So it's another form of standard candle. So by using these and going out further and further and further with better and better data, we finally have come to a, a, a plot like this. Now, I have to confess that this is really a plot that only an astronomer can love. And I feel a little bad for inflicting it upon you, but um, bear with me for a second. Um, so each of these dots represents a supernova. Um, and there's some error bars here to, to indicate that we don't know exactly how bright each of these guys were. And, uh, and something funny happened. As we started measuring these supernova further and further away, uh, a simple Hubble law uh, where the um, the more distant ones were moving away from us faster in a simple relation. It seemed like it no longer fit the data very well. That's this dashed curve, a simple expanding universe. Doesn't seem to fit these points very well. But this solid line up here fits this data a little bit better. And you're just going to have to trust me on this part, unfortunately. If you do a statistical analysis, you can see that the, 
the data fit this solid line much better than, the, than either of the dashed lines. Um, and there is something unique about this solid line. This is a, a line that doesn't, result, doesn't correspond to a, the universe simply expanding. It corresponds to the expansion of the universe accelerating. So this was a real mind blower in, in 1998 and 1999 when people first started noticing something like this in their data. Uh, the first thing that people said to themselves was, what, what is causing this? Uh, well, uh, it really acts as if gravity on very large scales has a repulsive component. And it's, it looks like gravity is pushing the universe apart when you look at these very f large distances. And, uh, and we've given that phenomenon a name. And we call it dark energy. Um, and here are a couple of uh, quotes from famous scientists here at the bottom. Our main achievement in understanding dark energy is to give it a name. <laughs> Ra, right on. And uh, would be number one on my list of things to figure out. Well, I agree. So this is why I'm interested in this subject, and it's why I'm working on it. A few of the things that we think we know, we think dark energy is approximately smooth. And what I mean by that is that if we look at the expansion of the universe in this direction, and we look at the expansion in the universe in this direction, we seem to get the same answer. So it's not, it doesn't seem to be um, different in different directions. Uh, as I said, it looks like it's acting as a repulsive force, making that expansion speed up, uh, causes the expansion to accelerate. And uh, as we'll talk about in a bit, it governs the ultimate fate of the universe, or perhaps it does. We'll get to that. But before we get too carried away with all of these grandiose ideas, um, whenever a scientist stands up before you and starts telling you stuff, you need to put on your, uh, put on your skeptical thinking hat and start asking questions. Um, so the first question is, is the evidence really solid? The supernova 1A measurements showed this acceleration, and the, those measurements seem to be relatively good. But you know, they could be wrong. There could be something funny going on with supernova that are farther away, something we don't understand. What's convinced me is that there are a number of other measurements now that also agree with the supernova data. There's measurements of something called the cosmic microwave background, which I'll mention a bit later. There's measurements of clusters of galaxies and uh, surveys of large number of galaxies. I'll talk about some of these in a bit. Um, but basically, all of these different techniques allow us to ask the same question in different ways. And multiple observations with different techniques done by different groups of scientists would have to be simultaneously wrong in order to get rid of the need for dark energy. That doesn't mean we understand what it is, but I would say I'm convinced that the evidence for it is solid enough to put my research time into trying to understand more about it. Um, how can we understand this theoretically? I, what I've described to you so far is what one might call phenomenology. We, we point our telescopes out at the sky, we write down what we see, and, uh, and it looks strange. But is there a way to understand the theory behind it? Well, I'm only going to pull one equation on you guys tonight. And that's Einstein's equation of general relativity. This is a doozy of an equation, but I'll try to uh, condense it a bit here for you. So th this is Einstein's equation of general relativity. On the left-hand side, we have this term here, which describes how space-time curves. So some of you who are science fiction fans may have seen a science fiction movie at some point where they show space-time curving, or maybe you've seen uh, an analogy where somebody has a rubber sheet with a big basketball in the middle of it that shows space distorting. That's what, that's what I mean by, uh, by this side of the equation. On the right hand of the equation is a term that represents all of the content of the universe. It's the stuff doing the curving, and that includes uh, regular matter, stars, gas, black holes, dark matter, everything, basically. The reason why Einstein is famous, uh, other than E equals mc squared, is, is this equation. He was able to explain how space-time curves is related to the stuff, the matter in the universe that's doing the curving of space-time. This is a, a simple looking equation, but it actually represents 10 coupled partial differential equations in four dimensions. And if you ever find yourself in graduate school in physics, uh, you'll spend many long evenings trying to calculate things with this equation. Even simple things take you forever. It's, it's a real bear. One thing that Einstein noticed 
with this equation was that he could add an additional term to the right-hand side. And he could add this additional term, and the equation would still work. And that's represented by this uh, letter here. This is the Greek letter lambda, and it's become known as Einstein's cosmological constant. Um, he recognized that he could add this extra term, and this equation would still make sense somehow. Uh, but before I get to that, let me digress. I, I, uh, I'm going to step back for a second. Um, so I, I told you a story about this equation. It turns out that this is more than just of esoteric theoretical interest. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with our global positioning satellite system. It's a system that uh, tells you your latitude and longitude. It uses a, a system of orbiting satellites. Um, people have them in their cars now. Some phones have them. It allows you to tell you where you are. Well, it turns out that the way those satellites work is that they send a signal to your GPS receiver. And in order for it to work, the clock on that satellite has to be calibrated very accurately. Well, Einstein's equation tells us that space-time can curve and that matter can do some of that curving. It turns out that the Earth's gravitational field curves space-time for those orbiting satellites um, in a way that's different than on the ground. And so a clock on one of those satellites runs at a very slightly different rate than a clock on the ground. Amazing stuff, but it's true. It turns out that a clock in, um, in space runs about 39 micro, 38 microseconds per day different in orbit than it does on the ground. Now, that seems like a small amount of time. Uh, but that difference in, in the speed of a clock in, in space versus one on the ground turns out to make a difference. If we didn't use Einstein's equation to make the GPS satellite system work, uh, it would be off in your location, and it works out to about six miles a day. So if you don't use this equation, uh, you get lost on your way to the ice cream store. <laughs> right, so back to the cosmological constant. So Einstein realized he could add this constant to the side of this equation. Well, why would you, why would you want to do that? Well, it turns out that um, without that term, Einstein found that his equation described universes that either expanded or contracted. It, there wasn't a, a, it didn't describe universes that were static. And at the time he developed his theory, everybody thought that the universe was static, that it was not expanding and wasn't contracting, that it had just always been there at exactly the same size. And he found that if he put in a little bit of lambda, he could make his equation work for a static universe. And so that's why he put it in. Um, historically, but as, we turned out, as it turned out later on, um, we now know that the universe is expanding. And as it turns out even more recently, we now think that it's accelerating. It turns out that if you add just the right amount of this extra lambda, gravity will appear repulsive on very large scales. And as it, it turns out that if you add a little bit of lambda to his equation, uh, all of a sudden his equation matches our observations pretty well. Um, the, the measurements of the accelerating universe, it's, they match pretty well. Well, it sounds good on the surface, but there's a little problem. There's a little problem with this lambda concept. Um, you can use the theory of quantum mechanics to make a prediction for the size of this lambda uh, constant. And if you do that, it predicts a value for lambda that's too large. It's too large by a factor of 10 to the 120. So that's, uh, just so we're clear, this is one with 120 zeros after it. Okay? Even by astronomy standards, this is a big, big error. Um, so that's a bit of an embarrassment, right? So we have, uh, we have something that looks like it might ma match the observations, but the theory just really just doesn't make it work. Um, and perhaps someday there will be someone clever who figures out how to modify quantum mechanics to predict the right number or comes up with a new theory, like string theory, that can predict the right number. But it hasn't happened yet. And so we're still scratching our heads about trying to, trying to explain uh, either lambda or some other form of dark energy. Um, and because this is off by such an astonishing factor, I think it's really prudent to keep our eyes open for other possibilities. Um, maybe there's a new kind of stuff in the universe, maybe this whole Lambda approach to thinking about dark energy, maybe that's just wrong and we have to think about something else. 
Or maybe Einstein's equation is just fundamentally wrong. This, this latter part, when I say Einstein's equation is wrong, um, it's possible that it's wrong, but it can't be wrong by a lot. It would have to be wrong in a small, subtle way. As I said earlier, Einstein's equation gets you the right answer for getting to the ice cream store. So it's not way wrong, but it could be a little wrong, and maybe there's some room there. Um, so we're still struggling with this, with this issue. How can we try to understand dark energy theoretically? Um, because we don't understand it, we've tried to uh, assign uh, a variable to our ignorance, and that variable is W. It's, uh, technically, it's, it's the ratio of energy, uh, of pressure to density in dark energy. Um, that's sort of a technical uh, issue with the mathematics of this. But you can think of it as just a variable that, pr that parameterizes our ignorance, if you will. If W takes on this value of minus 1, that would correspond to Einstein's cosmological constant. But there are other possibilities, and W might be something else. Um, so why am I telling you about W? Who, who cares about W? Well, it turns out that the very fate of our universe depends on the value of W. If W is between minus 1 and minus a third, the universe expands forever. It eventually gets colder and colder. Eventually, nearby galaxies will no longer be able to see. Our own galaxy will stay together, but some people have called this the lonely universe because other galaxies become very, very distant very quickly. A, a truly catastrophic thing happens if the value of W is less than minus one. Uh, this was uh, first described by my colleague Dave Caldwell at, at uh, Dartmouth. Um, if W is less than minus one, the universe starts building up dark energy uh, at an exponential rate. Gravitationally bound objects like our solar system and our planet get ripped apart. Solar system gets ripped apart. Atoms get ripped apart. And, uh, and my colleagues call this the big rip. Everything gets torn to pieces. You don't need to get too worried about this yet. Um, our current data says that if, you know, if W is less than minus 1, the soonest the big rip could happen is 22 billion years from now. So we have a, a ways to go. Um, all of this is a little, you know, it's a little funny to talk about this because it, it seems likely to me that dark energy is more complicated. It, it may not just have a simple constant value. Maybe it changes in time. Maybe there's something else strange going on. But for the moment, this is what we're reduced to. We're trying to figure out just the, the most simple things about uh, dark energy to try to make progress. Okay, so time to take a breather. I've thrown a lot of stuff at you pretty quickly. Um, so let's have a quick recap. So what we've talked about so far is our universe is expanding. Our current observations seem to indicate that that expansion is accelerating. We don't have a good theoretical explanation for why it should be the case or for what makes up 73% of our universe. We don't, we don't understand that. Uh, we've introduced this term W. Uh, which we'd like to try to measure, which will kind of uh, characterize our dark energy in one form or another. Uh, but as I said a second ago, we, we have to admit that maybe this is even the wrong way to think about it. Uh, but this is the direction that I think most of us who are working in this field would like to pursue for, for the near future. So the next part of this is to ask, well, Okay, so we have a mystery on our hands. Everybody loves a good mystery, right? So how can we make more progress? How can we learn more about dark energy? What techniques will yield some answers? Well, we're here at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. The first thing that might occur to you is, well, is surely there's some really cool lab with a big microscope in the, somewhere. Why don't, maybe we can just look at it in the lab. Unfortunately, this doesn't work. Uh, dark energy turns out to be a very, very weak effect. It's so weak that it's only through the vastness of space, with dark energy being everywhere, that it adds up enough to be able to detect. So the vastness of space in the largest distance scales immediately suggests to me that using astronomical techniques, using astronomy, is a natural way to try to find out more about it. Unfortunately, it really looks hopeless to try to discover dark energy in the lab or even in the solar system. 
So there are a number of ways to try to, to learn more about dark energy, and I'll, I'll mention a few of these. Um, some of these will be more technical than others, but uh, hopefully you'll get something out of this, and uh, I'll uh, take some questions at the end. So just relax, save up your questions, and we can really uh, go at it at the end. Supernova 1A, I've already talked about supernova as a way to measure distant galaxies moving away from us. I'd like next to talk about something called weak gravitational lensing. I'll explain that in a bit. And then something with a funnier name, baryon acoustic oscillations, I'll also describe in a bit. Our goal for the future is to measure this dark energy parameter, W, to better than 5% accuracy. And, uh, and that's something to keep in mind when we talk about some of these techniques. So gravitational lensing. So what I mean by that is the bending of light by a gravitational field. It turns out that, that gravity can actually bend light. And uh, this was realized as long ago as by Sir Isaac Newton in the 1700s when he wrote, do, bodies, do not bodies act on, upon light at a distance and by its actions bend its rays? So he recognized even then that, uh, that light or photons moving past uh, a massive body could be deflected by the gravitational field. Uh, so here's a, here's a diagram. Here's a, here's a star. It gives off some light. And as the light goes past our Mr. Sun, they're deflected a little bit. And uh, with a telescope, if you looked at a star, you could see a shift in uh, between where you were pointing your telescope and where the star was coming from just because the light was bent by the sun. Uh, so the first thing to recognize when looking at this picture is never point your telescope at the sun. Bad, bad idea. <laughs> Um, nevertheless, you can imagine this kind of experiment, right? And you can use Newton's laws to predict how much, how much that light should deflect. It turns out to be a small amount. It's 0.87 arc seconds for those of you mathematically inclined. Uh, that's, 0.87 arc seconds is small. That's, if you took a dime and you put it two kilometers away, that's, that's the angle of deflection from one edge of that dime sitting two kilometers away. That's the distance we're talking about. Um, Einstein's prediction for the same deflection is twice this value. So this is the kind of situation where I just love in science, okay? We have an experiment that you can imagine doing. You have two theories, and they predict precise numbers that are different, okay? So this means that if you do the pr appropriate experiment, you get to kill off one of these theories. And, really, and that's the way that science really makes progress. Specific predictions, testable predictions, good experiment. So as I said, don't point your telescope at the sun, but you can use a trick. <clears throat> at the end of World War I, Arthur Eddington used this trick. He went to the island of Principi, it's off the coast of West Africa, um, to a view a total solar eclipse. So he's going to wait until there was a solar eclipse. The moon passes between the earth and the sun, blocks out the light from the sun. Then you can point your telescope at a star nearby and see whether its position has shifted a little bit. Okay, so he did that measurement, and one of these two theories is right and one of them is wrong. You guys know the answer? Einstein theory triumphs. So this made the headlines of the New York Times. This was a big deal. Um, my favorite part here is stars were not where they seemed or were calculated to be, but nobody need work. <laughs> so... <laughs> so. Right, so here's the, here's the picture. Um, so this white stuff is the light of the sun peeking out from behind the moon, which is blocking most of the light of the sun. And if you look really carefully, maybe you can see this. Uh, in his article, he's put little dash marks around the positions of the stars that he was trying to measure. So the, these stars are still, there's still some glare from the sun tr trying to wipe out these measurements. Uh, uh, nevertheless, this is what he did. This is a hard, hard measurement. He had a little four-inch telescope, and of course, the moon goes in front of the sun. It gets colder when the sun goes away. The, he had a little glass plate for measuring this. Its temperature was changing. I think this is kind of a hard measurement, but nevertheless, he was able to do this. Um, amazing. Very exciting. Um, nowadays, we have even more spectacular measurements of gravitational lensing. This is, again, an image of a cluster of galaxies from the Hubble Space Telescope. 
And you can see some arcs in this picture. You can see these long, skinny things. Those are actually very distant galaxies. These, are, uh, these blobs here are, are galaxies in this cluster. These arcs are galaxies that are much more distant than this cluster. And their light is being bent by the mass of this cluster of galaxy. And the image is being distorted by that lensing. Uh, and so these stretched out images are really uh, very dramatic. This isn't some tiny shift that you're just barely squeaking by in some solar eclipse. This is a dramatic effect, um, very spectacular. There's a number of other examples of uh, lots of images now with, this, with these arcs and multiple images caused by lensing. Very cool. So this is what, what we call strong gravitational lensing. Uh, this is not the, the way to measure dark energy, but it's, I wanted to get you thinking about what lensing was like. The way to measure dark energy is with a technique called weak gravitational lensing. So instead of uh, light being bent by the sun or by large clusters of galaxies, this is light from distant galaxies that's being bent just a tiny bit by dark matter that's clumped and distributed throughout our universe. Um, one of the ways that you do this is that you observe a large number of distant galaxies and you measure the shape of that galaxy. And the way this works is that if you take a look over here, if you have a little galaxy, as its light travels to our happy astronomer over here with his telescope, uh, it's bent by this little clump of dark matter. So the position of the image is shifted a little bit and it turns out that the shape of that galaxy gets squished just a tiny bit. So uh, and that's from, this, from the lensing effect of this clump of dark matter. This is a very small effect. It changes its shape by about 1%. It goes, it goes from maybe circular to being squished a little bit. Um, and this is hard because you can't measure this with one galaxy. Because if you measure a galaxy and you see it squished a little bit, well, you don't know how squished it was to start out with. Was it a little football-shaped thing and then it got squished a little bit more? Or was it circular to start out with? You don't know. So the, instead, the way to do this is to measure a very large number of galaxies and to try to detect this effect statistically. Um, that turns out to be challenging, but it's, it's been done. So here's an example of it. Um, this is a, uh, a field of galaxies measured by the Hubble Space Telescope by uh, a number of astronomers, including some of my colleagues both here at JPL and at Caltech, uh, Richard Massey, Jason Rhodes, and Richard Ellis. Um, they conducted this survey with the Hubble Space Telescope, and they measured the shapes of about 400,000 galaxies. Now, it's a little hard to see here. It doesn't really look like a bunch of galaxies, so I'm going to zoom in here a little bit. So take this box, right, and we're going to zoom in. So uh, you zoom in a little bit, now you can see these guys are a little bit blobby. And one can try to measure their shapes. So this is, a, this is back to the, the full, full field here. So you measure the shapes of all of these galaxies. You see some of them are squished, and some of the squishes all appear to be in the same direction. You use these st statistical techniques. And from that, you can infer the distribution of dark matter between us and those galaxies. You can figure out what kind of dark matter there must have been to do some of that changing of shapes. And so from that, they were able to put together this spectacular uh, map of what the dark matter between us and those galaxies must have looked like. So it's in the sort of filamentary structure with a bunch of little blobs in it. Um, this was very cool to many of us working in the field, and it made the cover of Nature magazine, one of the premier science magazines. Uh, and this is a reconstruction of the distribution of dark matter. What does that have to do with dark energy? That, that was the topic of the talk here today. So this was dark matter. What, what's going on with dark energy? Well, it turns out that instead of just looking at, those, um, looking at that effect for things at one distance, one can split up those dark matter maps, and split up those galaxies into several slices at different distances different uh, uh, distances back into the past. And when you slice it up, one can see that the clumpiness in dark matter grows with time. So stuff that's further away is looking back further into the past of the universe. Um, as you look at how that 
evolves with time, one sees that the clumpiness of dark matter is growing because gravity is pulling it together. It turns out that how that happens in detail, how fast it happens, how clumpy it gets, uh, depend on the amount of dark energy and it depends on the nature of dark energy. So putting these things together allow us to, to make progress. Now this is such a new technique and so technically difficult that not a tremendous amount of progress has been made so far. Uh, this is sort of the first technique, but or the first uh, space-based uh, um, precise measurement of this, but uh, I think this is very promising for the future. There are some practical issues that make it difficult. I mentioned measuring the shapes of the galaxies. Well, here are images of two galaxies. This galaxy on the left, well, you can sort of imagine how you might measure its shape, right? You can get out your little ruler and you measure its distance in this direction, its distance in this direction, and you see how squishy it is or isn't. It looks kind of circular, but it, maybe it's stretched out a little bit in this direction. Um, but if you look at this galaxy, you might be scratching your head about how to measure the shape of this galaxy. How, how squishy is this galaxy? Well, it turns out that this is a, a, the statistical techniques to apply to this problem are complex, and there have been a number of conferences where astronomers from around the world spend a week meeting together to talk about this issue all by itself. Um, also, something that's been interesting to me is that telescopes respond differently to different wavelengths or respond differently to different colors. And although this galaxy seems to be pretty uniform in its color, this one is not. It's you know, a little yellower in the middle, a little bluer on the edge. And the telescope responds to those different colors differently, and that can, that can have an effect on screwing up your measurement. So it turns out there's a lot of technical hurdles to overcome before this really uh, can be pushed to the, uh, to the ultimate limit. I'll talk now for a few minutes about the other technique, baryon acoustic oscillations. Uh, we call this BAO, not to be confused with bao, which are the uh, steamed Chinese dumplings, which are very tasty. I haven't had dinner yet, so I'm thinking about some of this stuff. Um, BAO, it's kind of a confusing name, for, but what it refers to is a very large galaxy survey. One measures the spectrum and the position of each of the galaxies in this survey. In the future, this will be an extremely powerful technique. It's a technique that I'm working on. I see a few of you in the audience who are helping me on some of this stuff, uh, or I'm helping them on some of this stuff. Uh, this will be extremely powerful for the future. I, and I'll explain how it works, but to do so, I need to make a slight detour to tell you about the cosmic microwave background and about galaxy surveys. So the cosmic microwave background is something that I've spent uh, much of my career working on. Uh, the cosmic microwave background is the radiation left over from a hot, dense, earlier phase of our universe. The very early universe was much hotter and much denser than it is today. There were no atoms. There was only a, a hot plasma of electrons, protons, photons, and dark matter. As, as the universe expanded and cooled, Eventually, it got cold enough that that plasma could, uh, could dissipate. The electrons and protons could uh, um, combine together to form atoms. And then the photons can escape. And so you go from having what we call a plasma to having something called a gas, where the photons can just stream out to us. We see those photons today as the cosmic microwave background. Um, because the universe has expanded, those photons are shifted in wavelength, so they're now uh, it's called the microwave background. Most of these, uh, these are radio waves that peak in the microwave part of the, of the spectrum. Uh, and we now have uh, very detailed maps of that. This is a, a map of temperature, a map of the temperature of the microwave background. These are little hot spots and little cold spots. Red is hot and blue is cold. And there are very small fluctuations in this map that correspond to regions that were a little bit hotter or a little bit colder in the very early universe. This, was, this map was made by something called the Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe. That's another, God, uh, another NASA mission. Um, there is a European Space Agency mission that will follow up this work to make more maps of the microwave background with even greater sensitivity and greater precision that uh, many of us here at JPL are also working on. So these tiny uh, 
intensity fluctuations, these tiny little hot spots and cold spots in the early universe, they're only hotter or colder than the average by about one part in 10,000. So they're very small changes. Um, how, so how did we go from this very small uh, um, intensity fluctuations in the early universe to something today where we see galaxies and big clumps of stuff? Uh, we went from this to this. This is an image also from the Hubble Space Telescope of field of galaxies. When we look around the universe today, we see galaxies and we see clumps and, and stuff like that. Our modern understanding of how this worked is that these tiny fluctuations in density in the very early universe grew through gravity. One part was just a tiny bit denser than average. It pulled in stuff around it and it grew and it grew and grew uh, through uh, gravitational attraction to eventually become the positions of, uh, of clusters of galaxies and galaxies today. In the early universe, there was this hot plasma. And it, that plasma could, uh, was, was dense and it could support sound waves. Uh, there could be a, uh, if there was a little bit of disturbance in one part, it would propagate through that early hot plasma, much like ripples on a pond. But when the universe expanded sufficiently and cooled, that effect sort of turns off. And so whatever ripples were left are just frozen into the pattern. And that's, that's what caused that sort of uh, dappled effect we saw in that previous picture of the microwave background. Um, I've, I've drawn a picture of a, a, single, uh, a single disturbance and its ripple pattern out here. But the universe doesn't have just one little uh, fluctuation with these ripples. It's, loaded with this in a chaotic way. And so the, you, you can't really see these ripple patterns directly, but you can detect them statistically. And that's now been done with the cosmic microwave background. These ripples also represent uh, the sites where galaxies can form. So if you imagine there's sort of a ripple propagating out, um, you can imagine a spot that's kind of dense in the universe. There'll be a ring that's also dense that corresponds to uh, to how far that ripple pattern could have traveled in the early universe. The universe has expanded uh, since then. So the, so the size of this ring is now roughly 500 million light years. So it's much bigger. Um, but it turns out there's a, a dense region and then and a ring around it that's dense. And the result is that galaxies, these little blobs are meant to be galaxies here, uh, they're a little bit more likely to be um, spaced about 500 million light years apart, a little bit more likely to be this distance of this ring than they are to be any other distance. Now, galaxies can still form at other distances. It's just a little bit more likely that they'll be spaced by that distance from this effect. Um, so a few years ago, um, people started looking for this effect, and, um, and they found it. So this is, a, again, a statistical technique. So you have to be an astronomer to love this plot. But basically, if you make a, a statistical plot of how far away galaxies are apart from each other on average, there's a little bump here that corresponds to 500 million light years. Now, it turns out that the position of this bump uh, depends on the nature of dark energy. If there wasn't dark energy, this bump would be in a different place. It would be to the left or to the right if there was more or less dark energy. So this is, this is a technique that has just sort of recently been discovered, but will be, uh, be powerful for determining the nature of dark energy in the future. This also has some practical issues associated with it. Uh, it's, un it's a new technique, so it's unclear what, how well it will work in the long run. It requires one to take the spectra of each galaxy. I talked about spectra earlier. On a big telescope, it takes maybe half an hour to see the spectra of one of these galaxies. So if you want to do millions of these, that might take a long time. It's likely to be a powerful technique, and maybe we can make some progress with ground-based telescopes rather than, rather than space telescopes. So that was, a, that was a lot to swallow, I realize. I've, I've tried to cover all of modern cosmology in less than an hour, and that's, a, that's heavy going. So don't feel bad if some of this went over your head. I hope you can capture at least some of the flavor of, of why we're thinking about some of these things and where we're going with them. So I'll spend a few minutes now talking about what the next steps are. Uh, for weak lensing, in order to do this technique properly, I think it will require a space mission. 
uh, it will take something like the Hubble Space Telescope, but instead of just making a, little, a map of a little part of the sky, we'll need to cover a large part of the sky. And that will take something other than Hubble. Hubble is good at measuring small spots at a time. We need something that, that can measure um, large pieces of the sky at a time. Many of you probably have a personal uh, digital camera. It's maybe it's seven megapixels or maybe there's eight megapixels now. We need a gigapixel. We need something that's a hundred times uh, more pixels than your personal camera on something like the Hubble. That's what it would take to do this job properly. Um, and it takes, the, uh, it takes uh, very high optical quality, so it takes something like the Hubble optics in space. That kind of mission would really uh, measure W2 an accuracy of better than 5%. Um, and NASA and both, both NASA and the European Space Agency are actively considering and planning such a mission. Uh, the NASA version is called the Joint Dark Energy Mission and the European version is called Euclid. These are both under active consideration with lots of scientists working on the planning stages. For baryon acoustic oscillations, uh, one can make a lot of progress with a large ground-based telescope. The measurements I talked about earlier were measurements of 50,000 galaxies. We want to go from that to measuring maybe 4 million, 5 million galaxies. And if you want to measure the spectra of 5 million galaxies, it's really slow going if you have to do it one by one, half an hour each. Right? So one concept for addressing that problem is called the wide field multi-object spectrograph. This is a, an instrument that a, a number of us at JPL are working on very hard at the moment in the planning stages. We're uh, trying to do, uh, do the engineering design and some of the testing of parts for such an instrument. And the basic concept is instead of measuring the spectra one at a time, you try to measure the spectra thousands at a time. And here's a, here's a conceptual picture of a telescope. This is an eight meter ground-based telescope. Uh, for scale, uh, each one of these tubes here is maybe this big around. Okay. Each, each little doodad down here is the size of a small car. This is, this is a big telescope. So the way this works is that light comes from, comes from the sky. It hits this big circular mirror here. And it bounces up into this white collecting mechanism up here. This guy has thousands of optical fibers in it, which are precisely positioned to put the fiber on the position of an image of a galaxy. So that little fiber is, is moved back and forth until it lands on the image of a galaxy. You do that for thousands of galaxies at the same time. And then you take that fiber op you take that light, you pump it into a fiber optic, and you go down into the basement and you split all those thousands of fibers into these different systems. Each one has a, a mechanism for dispersing the light. And that allows you to disperse the light from thousands of galaxies at the same time, collect the spectra from thousands at the same time. And now if you do thousands at a time at half an hour each, you can start to imagine measuring millions. So that's something that we're very excited about and working on hard at the moment. So let me wrap up. Um, so the universe is expanding. That expansion is accelerating. And we don't know why. The concept of dark energy has been invoked to explain this acceleration. But as I've said, this is more really a label for our ignorance than it is an explanation. It's really just a name. We hope uh, to test some of, the fundamental Einstein, some of the fundamental ideas of Einstein with the help of new measurements and with new instruments that we're actively working on. And I think this will be an incredibly exciting journey. It's really amazing when you have in front of you several different competing theories and you have uh, an experiment or an idea for how to d distinguish between them. I think that's how science makes progress and I think it's, I think it's very exciting. And uh, we'll finish with this picture of Plato who's pointing at the sky. Keep looking up. All right. Thank you very much. All right, uh, I'll have, I have time for a few questions. We'll probably take 10 minutes or so, and then uh, we'll wrap things up. So let me start over here with this gentleman. Well, where will the BAL telescope, where are you anticipating it be set up? Right, so uh, we're anticipating a ground-based telescope that exists already on Mauna Kea. 
It's the Subaru telescope. It uh, was built by the Japanese. Uh, it has a distinguishing characteristic. It's very solidly built, so it can really hold a heavy mechanism up at its prime focus. That's a, a key part of this. Yeah, go ahead. If you measure, using that telescope, a thousand galaxies in a half hour, uh, and spend 500 hours reshuffling where those fiber optics are to the next one, have you gained? Yeah, well, how, how do you get to your next set of a thousand? And, you know, yeah, you, you, have, readjust you have to readjust those fibers very quickly. Um, it'd be nice to do it in less than five minutes, less than a minute. That's not a grad student doing that. No, you know, it, people, people have, uh, have worked with these fiber optic spectrographs in the past, and maybe what you're alluding to is the technique of the past. The technique of the past is you get a big aluminum plate, you drill a whole bunch of holes in it, and you have a grad student take one fiber, put it into one hole, the next fiber, the next hole, and, uh, and that takes a while, right? So one of the reasons JPL is involved in this project is that we have a lot of experience with micro -position positioning schemes. We have a lot of experience with mechanical engineering, uh, precision mechanics. Uh, so we have a uh, we have a, a mechanism, a technique for doing this very quickly. And because we're in a competition with another team, I won't tell you more about it than that. <laughs> okay, uh, right there. Um, you talked about trying to measure W to within five percent, and that's fine. That gives you some characterization of, of how strong the energy is. But still doesn't tell you anything about what it is, other than yeah, that's right. I think if we measure W to 5% and it lands right near minus 1, people will maybe be more, more leaning towards Einstein's cosmological constant as the explanation. If we measure something that's away from minus 1, I think that will blow the doors wide open on this field. I think most people are thinking that it, it is some form of Einstein's cosmological constant, and we just haven't been able to quite get the theory to explain the value of that constant yet. Um, so that, that's most of what people are thinking. But even if you knew that, if you knew that it was the cosmological constant, you still don't know that's true. what's causing it. Or that's not. true. That's true. So I, I think that's what we're reduced to for the moment, though. Well, maybe that's my segue. Like, um, we've heard about uh, the uh, dark energy maybe being baryon, uh, fermions and bosons not canceling out. Is that some of the quantum? Yeah, that goes into the quantum mechanical predictions of this. Um, I'm more on the observing and experimental side and a little less on the theory side. Um, but I have to say, I haven't heard anything that sounds even remotely convincing to me on the theory side. So I think we're wide open on that still. So uh, let me go back there and then I'll hit you. Yeah, go ahead. Um, you described W as a ratio of uh, pressure to density. Yes. Both positive quantities. Uh, and how can we get, get W as a negative number? Yes. Yeah, so it, in in cosmology, pressure can be negative, is the short answer. Um, so those are, uh, those are th I guess, uh, the way to say this is that when we're talking about a, um, when we're talking about a, f a field rather than a gas, it's more of a theoretical construct than it is, uh, you know, a, gas, a box of particles or something in front of you. Um, so that, that's the explanation. Does uh, dark energy provide any insight into the possibility of additional macroscopic dimensions? The, so the question was, does dark energy have anything to do with additional macroscopic dimensions? It might, but I think, uh, I think we don't know. I think we don't yet have a theory of extra dimensions that makes a specific enough prediction for us to be able to rule that in or rule that out. As I said in my talk, I think the, the place that you want to get to with science is to have a theory that predicts a specific number and another theory that predicts a different number, and then you can do an experiment to tell the difference. Um, with some of these theories about extra dimensions and uh, modifications of quantum mechanics, we're not yet to the point of being able to make predictions about numbers in a specific way. So it's really tough to, to make progress in that, uh, in that direction. You go over here. Is the uh, new particle accelerator expected to help shed any light on this? Yeah, sorry. So the, new, the question was whether the new particle accelerator, this one being built uh, in Switzerland and France at, the, at CERN, um, it's, I would say, not immediately apparent how it will answer the questions of dark energy. 
it, it will very likely provide some light on the nature of the particles that make up dark matter. And there may very well be some surprises in that direction that allow us to make some connection or make some progress. I think that's an extremely fascinating uh, experiment that they're working on. Uh, I think it will be many years before we know the outcome of that, but I think we're all excited to, to hear what happens. One of those graphs of uh, velocity versus distance, there are a number of uh, data points that were big anomalies off of the linear line. The beta off the line, yes. Is there any explanations of why they wouldn't be on a more careful linear line if it really a smooth? Yeah, I think the, the explanation is that uh, measuring supernova can be a tough business, and sometimes the galaxy in which the supernova occurs has some dust in it, or there are other, or, or maybe we're not sure that it's actually this kind of supernova as opposed to another kind of supernova. There's a, number of, there's a number of measurement errors that creep into it. I think that's the most likely explanation. Yes, back here. Um, um, about the pie chart of the universe, do we at least know that all of dark energy is one thing, or can it be a bunch of different sort of mechanisms? That's a great, great question. Is, is dark energy one thing, or could it be multiple things? We really don't know the answer to that. Um, and I think uh, the the way to make progress is to assume the simplest solution, one thing, mm -hmm. until we have any evidence for something else. I think that's probably what we'll do. Take, take. It seems to me if things get farther and farther away, they accelerate if they're getting closer and closer to the actual container of the universe, and it's the attraction of the container that's causing a gravitational attraction to accelerate. <laughs> so. Yeah, I think, uh, I think we don't know how big the universe is. We don't know if it's infinite or whether it's finite and wraps around itself. Uh, we know that it's larger than a certain size because we can observe uh, quite a long ways away. There's a number of ways that you can measure that the universe is at least, I don't remember the number, 26 billion light years across or something like that. Um, it could be farther than that and uh, could be infinite. I don't think we know. Well, let me wrap up there. Thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, enjoy your questions.